Okay, here we are at my third and final video on proteomics, and we're finally going to talk about how the uh, mass spectrometer actually records these spectra, and more specifically how we use that information to actually identify an unknown protein. Now, in no way does this video comprehensively cover all of the things that you can do with protein analysis. In fact, it's just barely scratching the surface. It really comes down to what we want to know. So if we are asking the question, like with this gel image here, this is SDS page, all of those bands represent different proteins. And if I have one protein along the list that I want to know what it is, then I can extract that protein. So take a razor blade, cut out the spot, and do MS analysis on that. So the goal is here, what is that band? In order to answer that question, what we're really doing here is we're looking for the primary amino acid sequence. So that sequence tells us that we have that particular protein. And in fact, you probably don't need to identify like the entire sequence because if you have enough of those letters, you should probably figure out that that must be that particular protein. So as for where we get these lists of protein sequences from, well, they're contained online in, in several different databases here. So this one here is called Uniprot. And basically there's like hundreds of thousands of different proteins. You can even download entire proteomes. So like uh, the yeast proteome, for example. So just looking up any given protein here, this is cytochrome C, you see it across different species. And once you click on that, you can basically get the entire sequence, the amino acids, and even the modifications that go along with that as well. Some of these proteins actually come from DNA sequences. So once you have the genome, you sort of automatically have the proteome, but there's still issues within that in the sense that we don't necessarily know if a protein has been created. So we do have other databases that are more strictly from identified proteins. Nonetheless, they're quite easy to, ex to access. Now, sometimes we actually know what the protein is and we have a different question. How much of a protein is there? So in this case here, we're not using the mass spectrometer in the qualitative sense, but purely for quantitation. So this is an example that's displaying a ton of proteomics data. It's actually for that plant over there as a, as a function of like where it grows along a high, ele high elevations, like in the mountains. And the color coding corresponds to like the increase or the decrease of given proteins. So you can see that they're kind of create these different patterns where the green is like upregulated proteins and the red is downregulated. So that tells us a lot about what's changing within the protein as a function of different physiological conditions. And as I mentioned in the last video, we're not just interested in the primary amino acid sequence. Sometimes it's purely the procentrous, purely the procentrous. Sometimes it's purely the post-translational modifications. So this is a great example here. This is a, a protein called troponin C, and this protein actually changes its modification in response to uh, changes within the heart muscle. So you can actually use this as a fingerprint to identify a heart attack um, or your risk of a heart attack based on the level of modifications from within. The interesting thing about this example is that if you just ignored the modifications and just looked for the protein as a whole, you wouldn't necessarily see the differences. So it's really important here to be able to understand the modifications levels and to quantify them as well. And finally, in this last example, now we're interested in how proteins interact with one another. So this web of a network is extremely complicated because Proteins don't have like a single target that they bind to. Some proteins can interact with many other proteins and they in turn interact with others. So they create what we call an interactome. So we can use mass spectrometry, for example, to take one protein and throw it in like as a bait to see what binds to it. And you might get thousands of different things that, that will attach themselves as an association to that protein. So this is another way of doing protein analysis with mass spec. Now there's many different ways to classify how we would use mass spectrometry to identify proteins, but this is, I guess, the most common way to look at it now. And we use the terms top-down analysis and bottom-up analysis as well. Each of these have their own advantages and I'd say disadvantages as well. They are fundamentally very different techniques. So I'm gonna start with bottom-up proteomics because historically it was the first one to come around. Now I actually already mentioned this in the previous video, but with bottom-up proteomics, we're always having this enzyme that's added to the sample to break it down. So instead of dealing with the intact whole big protein, we're looking at these smaller segments over here, which we'd refer to as peptides. The size of these peptides would vary, but let's say they're on the order of like one to three kilodaltons. 
And the reason why historically this was the preferred approach is because when these techniques first came around, quadrupoles were sort of the mainstay in mass spectrometry. So we didn't really have the tools to look at really large proteins with the appropriate resolution. This just made it an easier process. Now, on top of that, peptides are also much more well behaved than proteins are. So for example, we can take them through a reverse phase column and you'll get these nice beautiful separations that you see over here. So every one of those peaks would correspond to a different peptide. Or in fact, it's going to be more complicated than that. So even if you just took one single slice of this chromatogram, at that point there that it looks like there's only one peak, there's actually a whole abundance of different peptides that are originating from there. So from here, we can do a tandem MS experiment. And I described this previously. We're actually going to do what we call a data-dependent scan, where we would look at, like for example, the most abundant peptides within that, that spectrum. And then each of them, in turn, would automatically be subjected to a tandem MS experiment. Now, this is one way that you could handle a system that's so complicated, because you'd never have the time to sort of keep up with the, the runs. You couldn't just type in, hey, I want to look at that mass, and then that one, and then that one. It just keeps changing you on, on the fly. There is something called data independent analysis that basically looks at all of the data rather than saying, let's look at the top ones. But that's the story for a different video. All right, so we understand that we can select a given peptide and then do a tandem MS experiment. That will lead to fragmentation patterns, which we're going to use to identify the protein. How the peptide fragments is extremely important. So what you're looking at over here is the nomenclature that we define for looking at the, the, the peptide fragments. The peptide can fragment any way that it wants, but what it tends to do is to break along the peptide bond itself. So the, 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 the bond between the C and the N right there. And when that happens, we give the name of the, of the fragments that originate from that the B and the Y. Now, each of these basically corresponds to whether we're on the N terminal side where the charge is located or on, this, on the C terminal side. And yes, you could possibly observe both of these at the same time. All you would need would be to put another uh, charge on that so you could simultaneously observe it. You don't always just see B and Y. I mentioned that because for collision-induced association, this tends to dominate the fragmentation spectrum, but, but you can get the A and the X and the C and the Z, like all of these ions are possible. But I'm just going to focus on the B and the Ys because it's a little easier to see how this comes together. So let's just take this hypothetical peptide here. So P stands for proline, and it, it's just, it just doesn't really matter. It's, an, it's a string of amino acids. Now, we would know what the mass of this compound is because we have all the amino acids, we just kind of add them up together. So we know the molecular weight. Let's just assume for now that this is observed as a singly charged ion, which means that somewhere along there, there should be a single protonation. And yeah, most of the time, these are actually going to be doubly charged, but let's sort of build this up one step at a time. So the mass spectrum that we're going to see, even before we fragment it, is going to correspond to the mass of the singly protonated ion. Now, let's go through our collision-induced association. It's going to create a fragment somewhere. So let's just say that the fragment happens between that bond right over there. So that's going to break this molecule into two pieces. The original ion, the unfragmented compound, would disappear for the most part. Maybe there's a few molecules left over that didn't break down. And then what we're going to observe will just correspond to the side there that has the charge on it. So we can calculate the mass of that fragment, and we would observe it over here. This would be a B ion because it's on the N terminal side. And more specifically, we would call this a B3 ion because it has three amino acids on it. So it's a pretty simple naming for the nomenclature. Now, who's to decide that the proton happened to land over there? So let's say in another world or in, in another uh, simultaneous uh, event, some of that peptide actually had the, the charge on the other side. So if that were to happen, then yeah, the other fragment would be observed. You could calculate its mass and it would correspond right over here. And you notice that the two of them, if you add them together, are going to correspond to the original mass plus an extra proton attached to it. That ion over there, well, that would be a one, two, three, four, five, a Y5 ion. Now, 
where the fragment happens does not necessarily have to be at that one spot. In fact, it's kind of a random event that can happen anywhere. It's not truly random. In fact, like it's, it's very much directed by what the amino acid sequence is. But let's just say for simplicity's sake that it can cut anywhere. Along each of the amino acids, you can get a break. So you can generate the B1, B2, B3, B4, maybe not B1, but like the whole string of B ions. You can generate the whole string of Y ions and they show up kind of as this mess over here. The problem though is that there's no labels on them. There's no way to immediately distinguish a B ion from a Y ion. I'll help you out here by just kind of labeling it so it's like, aha, now we can see that there's a series of B ions and a series of Y ions. And that's important because the gaps between each of these is going to correspond to the mass of each of the amino acid residues. So if you could basically pick out a, a series of B ions and then look at the gaps between them, that will directly read to you what the amino acid sequence is. Now, there's a couple of exceptions. So for example, leucine, isoleucine, they have the exact same mass. And as I mentioned before, the B1 ions are hard to see. So usually the first fragment that you observe is already got two amino acids on it. But for the most part, you can see that we put the sequence together and it's, it's quite obvious what it turns out to be, at least when the spectrum looks as clean as this one here. Magic hand, magic band, magic. Yan, sand, van, can, jan, pan, fan, fan, wan, wand, oh! Now, you could imagine that in an, a proteomics experiment, we could generate thousands, if not tens of thousands, of that unknown spectrum. Across a one hour chromatogram, we have so many peptides coming out, and tandem MS today can generate something like at least 20 spectra per second. So you can run through a lot of data in a hurry. There's no way that you would manually want to try to interpret the BYI and spectrum from there. And fortunately, we don't have to. So the way that this is done sort of in an automated fashion is to simply compare the spectrum that we recorded versus, let's call it a theoretical spectrum. That theoretical spectrum comes from the database of proteins that we already know. And a computer program is just designed to automatically calculate all the B and Y ions that correspond to it. It's a little more complicated than that, but let's just summarize it from here. So what you then need to do is sort of go along and compare and create some type of a score. So this is a correlation factor that's applied to it. It is math that goes into it, but that doesn't matter right now. Ultimately, the computer just sort of creates a match and decides how good is the match and puts a score on that, and then quite obviously, the highest score is the one that we're gonna decide that's a match. It doesn't mean it's right. It, it could be that there's another peptide out there that, that matches very closely. It, it, the, maybe sometimes it's just matching against noise. So there's no guarantee that this is right, and there's all kinds of statistics that goes into deciding if this is right or wrong. But ultimately, this is how proteomics is done at the bottom up level when we're dealing with tandem mass spectrometry. Now, everything I said here with bottom up proteomics pretty much also applies to top down. The difference is that we skip the digestion step. So now we're dealing with like this giant spectrum of one big protein molecule. And every one of the peaks that you observe is a different charge state for the ion. You notice that the, the spacings between those things is not actually exactly the same. So this is not an isotope distribution. This is over a very broad mass range that we're corresponding to the charge state. We could calculate that. We already did it. So like, you know, there's the charge for one of these ions and you can fill out the rest. So a top-down experiment will still involve selecting an ion that you want and fragmenting it from there. So a tandem MS experiment. Now you might be wondering, well, like, isn't this much simpler? Like there's no digestion involved. It's only one protein instead of multiple peptides. Well, conceptually it is easier, but the real challenge with it is that these compounds have extremely high charge states to them. So it becomes extremely difficult to distinguish between different masses. The, the Z needs to be known. The fragmentation pattern that we'll observe by fragmenting this is going to be ridiculously insane. And back in like the 1990s when bottom up was first starting to come around, you would never get a spectrum that would be as sharp as this. The resolution of mass spectrometry at the time just wasn't able to handle spectra. This just looked like noise. 
But within that noise, or what looked like noise, you actually have a full fragmentation pattern of your entire protein molecule. So like before, it's just a matter of you know, databases to come out and interpret that spectrum. Now I should mention as well that when it comes to fragmenting a big molecule, CID might not necessarily be your best friend. There actually are all kinds of other different ways to fragment a protein. CID works, but only to a point. It, it's because the protein is so large that it sort of flexes instead of fragments. So we have things like electron transfer dissociation, which basically adds an electron and it's, it creates like this alternate form of fragmentation. IRMPD is, is, well, it's something that's only used in FDICR. More recently, we've got UV photo dissociation, which uses light to break things down, and the list can go on. But this combination of tools is really necessary to bring out the, the, the simplicity of being able to fragment ions with top-down proteomics. Now, when it comes to comparing top-down and bottom-up, I'm not going to say here, oh yeah, one is better than the other. They each have their place and both of them are being used. Bottom-up has a longer history, but top-down is becoming more prominent today as the types of mass spectrometers and the tools that we have around it are increasing from there. One of the main players in, in top-down proteomics is, is that gentleman right there, Neil Kelleher, um, who, who's developed a lot of the tools associated with top-down proteomics, including like the software and, and methods for handling proteins. My lab as well has uh, made some contributions in this field when it comes to separating and, and purifying intact proteins as well. But without bottom-up, proteomics was not going to be where it is today. We still need both of these tools to be able to tackle the questions that proteomics is giving us. And the field of proteomics is continuing to evolve. We're just getting better at tackling harder problems because we have better tools so we can study more complex scientific questions. So that's it. Uh, we'll see you around in the next one.